this was going to be a fairly straightforward lesson about programming an ultrasonic distance sensor, but as I worked through it, I realized there was quite a bit to cover, even though it's not that many lines of code. So there are five things you'll learn in this lesson. You'll learn to understand the difference between using polling and interrupts to monitor a sensor, learn how to program a motion sensor using interrupts, define rising and falling edges, understand how to use a stack for temporary data storage, and understand the concept of threads using a callback function. There isn't a lot of hardware involved for this project. We've got a Raspberry Pi 4, a breadboard, a tea cobbler and ribbon cable to make connecting the Raspberry Pi to the breadboard a bit easier, then the HYSRF05 or F05 ultrasonic motion sensor, and a bunch of jumper wires. So we wire up the circuit. The wiring is relatively simple. The VCC pin on the sensor is connected to 5 volts. The trig pin is connected to GPIO4. The echo pin is connected to GPIO17. The fourth pin on the sensor is named out and it's not used. And the fifth pin, GND, connects to ground. Before we go any further, let's talk a bit about how the sensor works. You've probably heard that bats navigate by echolocation. They send out a sound and listen for the echo to figure out the direction and distance to objects around them. The ultrasonic sensor we're using functions in a similar manner. We trigger it to send out a short burst of sound and then it tells how long it took for the sound to return. Knowing the time allows us to calculate the distance because we know the speed of sound is more or less constant. The way our sensor reports data isn't quite the way you might expect. You would think that we would record the time that we sent out the sound, then check the time when it hears the echo, and compare those two times to get the duration of the sound to go out and back. But the sensor makes it a bit easier for us. What it actually does is that it sets the echo pin to high for a duration that is equal to the time that it took for the sound to go out and back. So the amount of time the echo pin is set high tells us the distance that was measured in time. So our program needs to do a few things. First, it needs to trigger the sensor to send out a burst of ultrasonic sound. Then have the sensor listen for the echo to come back. As soon as the sensor sets the echo pin to high, we need to record the time. Then when the sensor sets the echo pin to low, we need to record that time as well. We can then calculate the duration that the echo pin was set to high by subtracting the first time from the second. And finally, we can use that duration to calculate the distance. Before we move on to looking at the program, there's some terminology that you should be familiar with, so I'll address it here before we get into how we use the program for managing the sensor. If you think about how we're using the pins on the Raspberry Pi, most of the pins provide us with a digital signal. They are either set to high, which is sometimes considered to be one on or up, or it's set to low, which is zero off or down. An edge occurs when the signal goes from low to high, which is called a rising edge, or from high to low, which is called a falling edge. GPIO has a function called event detect, which can detect only rising edges, only falling edges, or both. In our case, we want both rising and falling edges to be detected, and you'll see that functionality show up when we get deeper into the program. One more concept to understand before we get to the program. Usually when we collect a bunch of data points, we store them in a list or a dictionary or a tuple, and often retrieve them using the corresponding keys to identify them. A stack is a simplified way of using a list without having to use the keys to retrieve each piece of data. A data stack is very similar to a physical stack. Imagine you're a teacher and students are handing in their assignments on your desk by piling them one on top of the other. When you start to mark them, you'll likely start with whichever paper is on top of the pile. You grab the top paper, mark it, and hand it back to the student. Then you grab the next paper off the top and continue. A data stack is similar. You keep pushing data onto the stack, and when you want to use the data, you pop it off the stack. Popping the data gives your program the piece of data to work with and removes that data from the stack. So the next time you pop the stack, you'll get the next piece of data. You can keep popping the stack until the stack is empty, or you can push data back on at any time. When you push and pop data off the stack, it's called a last in, first out, or LIFO stack, because the last piece of data you put onto the stack is the first one you'll get when you pop the stack.
It's also worth noting that you can have a first in, first out, or FIFO stack as well when you push data onto one end of the stack and pop it off the other end. In Python, there is no special data structure for a stack. We just use a list to store the data, but we use the pop command to make it behave like a stack. You'll see how it's used in the program. The first three lines import modules that we need for the program. GPIO for managing the input and output pins, time so that we can get the time, and statistics for determining the median value in a list. Then we have some constants that define the pin numbers we're using, the number of samples we'll take for each distance measurement, and how long it sleeps between measurement sample requests, and some numbers we use to calibrate the sensor as well as a timeout duration. Next we have the GPIO setup. Set warnings is set to false to minimize the number of messages that come through when we're running the program. Set mode says we're using the Broadcom pin numbering scheme rather than the physical numbering. Now we configure the two pins we're going to use for trigger and echo. The trigger pin is set to be an output pin and the echo pin is configured for input and we set it to use the internal pull down resistor to eliminate any noise that might be caused if the pin was left to float. Noise on the input pin will cause the program to generate inaccurate distance measurements. Finally, we initialize some variables. The samples list is a list where we'll store the 10 samples or 5 samples we take for each distance measurement and stack is where we will store the start and end times of the echo pin being set to high. So far, it's all the stuff you'd expect when working with your Raspberry Pi GPIO ports. Now let's jump ahead to the main program. There's not a lot here because most of the work is done in the functions. We'll skip this first line for a second and focus on the next two lines. The main part of the program is check distance, which calls the function that does the operation for checking the distance. Go figure. The function call is surrounded by a print statement, which will display its output on screen. Then those lines are wrapped in a for loop, which will run a hundred times, so the program will output 100 distance measurements in about 25 seconds or so. Now let's talk about polling versus interrupts for working with sensors. If I could summarize and perhaps oversimplify for the context of this project, polling means that your program keeps checking in with the sensor whenever it gets the chance to see if its echo pin has been set to high. If it's not just set to high, it continues on through the program. Interrupt driven means that when the pin changes to high, it sends out a signal to the program and the program will do whatever you want it to do when that event occurs. The advantage of using interrupts versus polling is that if the echo pin gets set to high while your program is busy doing something else, it's possible that it will miss the rising edge. The responsibility for catching the change is on your program. If your program is busy doing a lot of other stuff, it's possible that it will miss the start of the pin getting set to high, which will make your distance less accurate, or it might miss it completely. Using interrupts means that the responsibility for noticing when the rising edge happens shifts away from your main program. When the interrupt is triggered, your program starts a separate thread of program functionality referred to as a callback function. This callback function can perform some operations without directly affecting your main program, so your program can continue whatever it's doing and work with the data from the interrupt whenever it's ready. Let's talk about how it works in our system with the sensor. The first line tells the GPIO module to add event detect on the echo pin for both rising and falling edges and to use a callback function named timer call. We introduced event detection earlier, so in this case we want both rising and falling edges to be detected. The third parameter is callback equals timer call. This means that when an event is detected, a separate thread is started which runs the function named timer call. This function can run while the rest of your program continues running. Now let's go and look at each of those functions in detail. The timer call function is very simple. All it does is take the current time with a lot of decimal accuracy and store it on the list called stack. The trigger function is also pretty simple and instructs the sensor to send out a burst of ultrasonic sound by setting the trigger pin to high and then switching it to low after 10 microseconds. The check distance function organizes the work of getting and reporting the distance measurement. This is where most of the work gets done. First, it does some house cleaning to make sure the list of samples is empty. Remember, we take five or 10 sample measurements for each distance measurement we're going to return to the main program, and they're stored in this list. So each time we initiate a new measurement request, we need to clear the list first. 
We set up a while loop to go through the sample process five times and then trigger the first ultrasonic pulse. Now the stack variable is where we're going to store the times of the rising and falling edges on the echo pin. The length of the stack tells us how many pieces of data are on the stack. So if the length of the stack is less than two, we know the system hasn't heard the echo yet. The program will stay in its loop waiting to see if the stack fills up with two entries. However, there are times when the echo is lost or the sensor doesn't get it clearly, so the system can get stuck in this loop. To avoid that, we need to do some timeout testing. We do this by first recording the time that we entered the waiting loop, and then we start another loop that keeps checking the time until the current time becomes greater than the start time plus the timeout interval. If that happens, the system triggers another ultrasonic pulse to be sent. Once the stack has two entries, it pops the two entries off the stack and uses them to calculate the time it took for the sound to go out and echo back and then adds that calculated time to the samples list. While it's theoretically impossible for the system to have more than two items on the stack, I added in this ELIF statement just in case so that the program wouldn't get stuck in a loop forever. This could also have been done with a timeout, but it was easier and takes less processing this way. In the event that the stack has more than two entries, it clears the stack so that it's ready to start a new sample. The next line is a brief pause to make sure the sensor doesn't get overloaded with requests. It can handle up to 20 per second, so this sleep should be conservative. If the while loop isn't finished, then it starts over. If it is done, it does some calculations on the medium sample time that it generated and returns the distance in centimeters to the main program. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the program when it's actually running. Here's the physical setup we've got. We've got our sensor right here. We've got a ruler along the bottom and we've got a vertical surface at the end that I can use to reflect the sound back. Let's go ahead and start the program. And you can see it starts sending out the distance data right away. It's about 27 centimeters and I move it in. I can move it in, say, to 10 centimeters, and it's reporting 10, and move it back to 15. And as you can see, as I move in and out, the distance adjusts accordingly. When I get up a little bit closer, it's not as accurate, but certainly reasonable. So no matter where I go, it gives a pretty accurate measurement. There are some times if you move too quickly, it'll get some spurious data that's not very accurate, but most of the time, if you're moving at a reasonable speed, you get good data output.